Hi, so welcome. Um, I'm going to be talking about multi-unit OpenStack deployment using uh, uh, LexD containers on your laptop. So hopefully you're all in the right place. Uh, looks like a good turnout, so thank you for coming. OK, so who am I? Uh, my name's James Page. Um, I work for Canonical, uh, and I've been technical architect on the OpenStack team uh, for the last 18 months or so. My background in OpenStack and Ubuntu uh, is over the last six years. Um, I remember it right from its infancy to where it's got today. I've been working in open source technology for about the last 15 years. Um, a Debian developer, Ubuntu core dev, and OpenStack contributor. And the OpenStack engineering team at Canonical are responsible for the packaging you'll use on Ubuntu, um, the, the deployment tooling we have around that, which I will touch on today, um, and the testing and, and putting that all together as part of our release every six months. OK, so first thing I'm going to talk about is OpenStack is hard. So, such a plethora of uh, different services performing different functions to orchestrate uh, uh, an infrastructure as a service cloud becomes very difficult to put together. Some of you may recognize this picture. Uh, it's been around for a while. <sighs> it's the wiring diagram from hell. Um, it, it, it's really, really hard to put together an OpenStack cloud. Um, it's very easy to follow the upstream documentation if you've got the willpower to get through the many hours that may take you um, and do it by hand, but you only really want to do that once just to learn how it all plugs together. And, and then it becomes, uh, you, need, uh, you have the requirement to have a repeatable process to, to then start doing that. So it means that when you start deploying a cloud for the first time, you have a question as to how are we going to do this? How are we going to make sure that what we put down today, if we need to expand it, that works. If we need to redeploy it in a different location, that works. How do we make sure that all plugs together? So I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about the uh, service modeling tool we use at uh, Canonical for, for putting down clouds. And I'm going to talk about containers, and then I'll talk about putting that all together. So you are in the right place still, don't worry. So uh, Juju is the, the service modeling tool we've been working on at Canonical for probably the, for about the last five years. Um, it allows us to uh, deploy services, scale them out, integrate them together. Uh, relations between services are very easy to model. And uh, we can use that, all those concepts and then put them down on different providers. So on bare metal, on top of clouds, such as OpenStack, for, for things you want to deploy on top of it. Um, or in containers, which is the, the topic of this talk. So for the, for the bare metal, this is how we put down OpenStack itself. We use a tool called MAS, Metal as a Service, and we can deploy using Juju and the charms, which encapsulate each component of OpenStack, an entire OpenStack cloud on, on hardware. We also combine containers into that to make sure your control plane is ni nicely segregated from the underlying physical resources and from each other. So Neutron and Nova and Cinder are all in different containers within that deployment. But I'm not going to talk about that too much today, because I, I want to get on to uh, the stuff I've been working on to, to make this all happen on your laptop. So this is what an OpenStack model looks like in Juju. Uh, all the various different components, dashboard, database, messaging. I've got some Ceph in there as well for, for block storage. We can apply things like NTP on top of that to make sure we have consistent time, uh, that sort of thing. And, and all the relations between them, we can encapsulate this in, in a model, and then we can take that and deploy it onto hardware. But how do we condense a cloud? How do we take all those things that we find great and use every day to deploy on, on, on our, our server hardware. How do we take that and do it on a laptop? How do we, how do we take all those modeling concepts that we like and, and test them on a regular basis? Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about next. So I'm going to dive in and talk about LexD for a little bit, which is the underlying container technology that, that um, I've used to, to put this together. So LexD is a, a pure container hypervisor. It gives us the ability to do very dense and very performant full system containers on, uh, for, for Linux guests. So don't try and use Windows in a LexD container. It doesn't work. Um, you're getting direct access to the, the, the Linux kernel that the host is running, and it's a containerized set of processes on top of that. And we'll dig into that a little bit, how, how that's different to an application container in a second. So LexD is a project that's been around for about 12 months, so maybe a little bit over that. I think we named it in Paris, and it's been in development ever since then. Um, LexD is a, a, a kind of ground up redesign around the user experience for managing Linux system containers. So you may have heard of the word LexC before, and that was the, the group of technologies to manage um, Linux system containers on, on Ubuntu and Red Hat, and all, all of the Linux distros have really adopted that. But LexD was an opportunity to kind of uh, reflect on the work that had been done in LexC and think about how to design the command line UI, um, how to put a REST API on top of this to, to make it very consumable, both for 
uh, for people and for, for um, other tools, so things like Juju, OpenStack, that sort of stuff. So it's got a lovely, simple REST API. It's designed from the ground up to be very, very simple to use. It's designed to be fast. You know, spinning, we all expect that a container spin up is fast, so LexD is fast. Um, we haven't reinvented the wheel from, in terms of uh, storage backends and stuff like that, um, so we're leveraging a lot of um, other mature technologies. Um, so a lot of the overhead of con creating container is not starting the processes, it's actually creating the file system um, image that you're going to run the con uh, underneath the container. Um, so we've leveraged um, fast storage backends with copy on write features such as ZFS, LVM, and ButterFS to make that spin up of a container very, very fast. So we essentially goal copy the image, and then each container then uses that image, starts up pretty quick, and I'll demo that shortly. Lexi designed to be secure. Um, so we took, took that approach. Le Lexi containers have developed the required security features over the last six years um, to, to make it a, a real story. So um, a LexD managed container is by default an unprivileged container. So that means the processes in it are not running as root on the host OS. So they're running as a, as a sub UID range as a, of an unprivileged user. That means if you did have a container breakout, all that breakout exposes on the host is an unprivileged user. So yeah, it's still a problem. Um, and we don't want that to happen. So we also wrap our containers in AppArmor, which means that um, the processes within the container only have access to certain paths on the, the host OS. Um, they can only perform certain operations that we, we allow them to configure. So network interfaces, parts of the file system, that sort of thing are all restricted in that way. LexD itself, in terms of its API, um, we use TLS encryption through and through on the, on the network connect connectivity to the REST API. Um, with uh, client certificates for authentication. So again, we just used a, a whole load of existing technologies to secure the product well. Uh, Lexi, if you're interested, is written in Go. Um, uh, we've been uh, heavy users of Go since we uh, took the decision to put, make, write Juju in Go about uh, three years ago. And it's, it's worked very well for this project as well. So what is Lexity not? Uh, Lexity is not about application containers. We're not trying to compete here with Docker or Rocket which are very much about containerizing a single process using those same base Linux technologies and, and managing those at scale. On the other end of that, we've got all of the hypervisors we know well, so Hyper-V, KVM, and this is where LexD plays. It's about full system containers, machines you can log into. They've got SSH, they've got syslog, they've got cron, they've got all the things you would expect from a server install or a KVM instance, so you can use all your existing tooling to manage them, um, but you've got all the benefits of containers. So you're next to the metal, you're getting bare metal level performance. You've got um, high density on that as well because the overhead of each container is very, very minimal. Okay, so um, I'll just give you a quick demo of LexD itself. Let's see how I get the right monitor going. second, I'm having a, a multi-display disaster now. We should get there in a second. Okay, let me just increase the font on that so you can actually see it a bit. So um, this is the uh, Lexi command line API. So um, this is in interacting with the daemon via a local unit socket using the REST API, but that could, you can equally manage remote Lexi daemon in the same way. Uh, using uh, um, the, the TLS transport. So um, I'm going to show you that I've got a, a few images loaded in here. So I've got a Trusty and a Xenial image. So uh, Lexity provides a, um, a number of ways to get images in. Uh, a Lexity image is typically a root tarball. Um, it's not a QCOW2. So it's a different image format to, to, to what you'd be familiar with with KVM. Um, on this system, I've got, and this is all on my laptop, I've got um, ZFS configured on half the SSD. So ZFS is um, a feature of our 16.04 release gives you very fast uh, performant copy on write clones, so it makes a, 
a perfect partner to LexD in terms of how we manage the underlying storage for containers. You can see I've got a load running. I've pre-deployed my OpenStack. It was not enough network in the room to do it, but we'll get into that in a minute. So um, if I want to launch a container, Um, stable, um, so ButterFS had a lot of the same features, but um, I think a lot of people have been burnt by ButterFS and its stability and production grade redness seems to be variable in people's opinions. Um, ZFS had a slightly different semantic, so it's more of a combined um, LVM and storage file system. Can, can I actually just part the question until the end and then so we can get through the content first, thank you. So um, I'm gonna launch a um, Ubuntu Xenial container. It should take about two and a half seconds. And I'm just going to hop into that so you can see. So um, the exec command is uh, allows the um, someone on the local, local or remote system to get a, sh a shell directly into that container. Again, it's secured via the authentication that the, the client's providing. So you can drop in and you can see instantly that we got in it. Um, this is actually a systemd based container, so we can do the, the normal operations you'd expect. So we can see SSH is running. We can see the, the operate within the container in, in, a, in a normal view. So uh, that's LexD very quickly. It's very easy to install if you want to try it. 16.04 works out of the box. Okay. Why a project is never easy. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about next is how we've, we've plugged um, Juju together with LexD in our 2.0 release of Juju um, to, to allow you to deploy Juju services on, on containers on your laptop. So th this is a feature we've actually had for a while. It used to use LexC, the, the base primitive, rather than the daemon on top. Um, and it allows you to deploy those Juju models and charms on, on into LexD containers on your laptop. So, um, as I said before, this is all completely functional in 16.04. You can run it on 14.04, but there's a lot more hoops to jump through in terms of kernel versions and backports and stuff like that. So if you want to try it, I'd try it on 16.04. Um, as I said, I'm using ZFS as my storage backend. You also have LVM and ButterFS. And if you don't have a dedicated block device to do that on, you can do it using a sparse uh, file directly managed by ZFS on top of your XT file system, XT4 file system if that's on your route. That works fine, it's pretty performant and gives people an instant bootstrap. Um, I'm running this on my laptop. I can run a whole cloud on an i5 with 16 gig of RAM and about a 200 gig SSD in total. It doesn't need much more than about 50 for the actual cloud. So I'm gonna deep dive on a couple of little features that we've, we've used to, to make this. So as I said, that uh, legacy containers by default are um, secure. Um, they're unprivileged. Um, they have limited access to devices on the host. But um, Lexi also has the capability to um, expose more things to a particular container. It does that through a thing called a profile. So that can be, um, it can map devices from the host directly into the container. Um, it can um, 
give it additional um, security permissions, like being able to do uh, nested uh, uh, network namespaces, that sort of thing, and that's then controlled via App Armor in terms of the permissions it has. Um, we can give it extra network interfaces, so we can map a container into multiple bridges on the host, so that we can um, have multiple network ports in our underlying containers, uh, and that's hot pluggable as well. So you can apply that to a running container and get additional <laughs> network interfaces. And we'll drop into that. I said I don't want to risk the monitor again. Uh, once we get into the demo, I'll, I'll show you a profile. And we've, we've got a particular bundle. So a bundle is a, a group of charms, uh, the configuration of them and the relations between them. It's up on GitHub, and there's a URL at the end of the presentation if you want to go and take a look, and some good documentation there as well. But a bundle is, it, it, we have a LexD uh, an OpenStack on LexD bundle which has got all the right config knobs tuned to allow you to do this. Okay, so let's have a look at the, the cloud I've got running. Okay, so um, just start with uh, Juju. So this is the command line interface to Juju. Juju has uh, a GUI, um, which is as of 2.0 is baked into the core product. As soon as you bootstrap an environment, you can access the GUI. It also has a command line interface. So uh, for those of you who like to live on the CLI rather than through a web UI, this is perfect. Um, or in fact, it exposes more of the features of Juju than the, the GUI does. The GUI is designed to be an abstraction on top of that. Uh, with a nice view, and I'll, I will show you that in a minute. But this this is the OpenStack deployment we've got. Now, I've trimmed down the number of services purely because um, I wanted to squeeze it in on, on this laptop. So um, we've got the core core infrastructure services, Cinder, Glance, Keystone, uh, Neutron, and Nova, um, and, the, and the dashboard as well. Um, I haven't put Swift in. Um, requires quite a number of containers and was just a little bit more than my laptop could, could manage, but it is possible to do that. So we're using a, a Ceph storage backend, um, which is managed purely through the file system, so no requirement for block devices. And we're using the Radius Gateway just to provide some basic um, object storage services on top of that instead. Um, we've also got MySQL and RabbitMQ deployed to provide all the, the core infrastructure services for all those components. So uh, if we look at the, the actual cloud itself, Typing and looking is hard, isn't it? So we've actually just got a single compute node, so we can query the, the kind of status of the agents and stuff like that. And you can see in the neutral agent. So we're running a, um, a network node as well um, to provide the north-south traffic routing. So um, we're able to fully use overlay networks uh, as part of the container story as well. So this is actually running GRE, but VXLAN works fine. And then we have um, uh, what we call our neutron gateway node, which is a network node, which then provides a north-south traffic routing and floating IP access to instances. Uh, so I have to admit I've already preloaded <coughs> a image and configured a couple of networks. Um, So we've got the, the underlying external network, which maps onto the, the IP configuration of the bridge on the host, and that's shared with the DHCP range for the Lexi containers itself, although that could be a separate bridge if you wanted to do it that way. And I've also got an internal GRE network set up as well. So let me try and find, not that one. This one. Uh, so I said there's, the, there's a GUI view of Juju as well. This is the, the same view of that, the, the model that I've got running on my laptop, but uh, viewed through the GUI instead. So you can, again, you can see the, the various different components here, RabbitMQ, uh, we've got the Ceph Rados gateway and Ceph itself, and then all of the Cinder components. Now each of these is running in its own container, and, and Juju provides the relation semantics for those things to communicate with each other during configuration, set up things like uh, usernames, passwords, that sort of stuff. So I've been able to use exactly what we do for physical hardware to deploy that onto my laptop. So um, just to prove this isn't all a uh, neat trick and it doesn't actually work, um, we'll log on to the dashboard. So if we have a quick look at the hypervisors first, we'll see that the, there is a, a QME hypervisor. So this is running, gonna run a KVM instance. Um, and we'll hop in. And launch 
launch an instance. Let's get rid of that dial up there. So I'm going to boot it from the Xenial image that we saw on the glance image output a minute ago, uh, just using an ephemeral storage <coughs> route. Give it, make it an M1 small. Add it an internal network connection. Uh, we don't worry about network groups or security groups at the moment. Uh, I've got a key pair loaded as well, just so we can access it afterwards. And that should be enough to give us a, a running instance in a container on my laptop. Fingers crossed. It worked 30 minutes ago. It should work now. So um, the way we've been able to do this is, is, is um, we have LibWork running inside the container. Um, we've exposed the um, host devices that LibVert and OpenVSwitch need to be able to communicate with the kernel via a profile into the container. So uh, slash dev KVM, slash uh, dev ton net, and uh, slash dev mem are all things that those particular things need to use to be able to, to manage the, either the networking or the, uh, the state of the instance directly. And we've got a running instance. So um, let's just check the console log, make sure we've got some networking. I don't know whether you can even see that. It's bit, there we go. So the instance spun up. It's got an IP address from the internal network range via from the DHCP services running on the network node, which is on a different unit container to the one running the Nova Compute instance, and, and it's fully booted. So um, I will just drop onto the command line again, and we're just going to have a look at exactly what that looks like under the hood. So. If you've ever lo logged on to a, um, an OpenStack hypervisor, you probably run this command. So you can see here on the internal bridge, we've got the, the connection to the KVM instance, and we've got on the tunnel bridge, we've got the, the, the tunnel link out to the, uh, the network node to provide north-south traffic routing and, and DHCP uh, services, that's uh, metadata services as well. Um, and you will see exactly the same view, so I can, same familiar tool, so if you want to look at the actual instance, I can see there's a running instance from within inside the container. Um, and we'll now try and access that. So I'll flip back to the dashboard for a second. Now I'm going to give it a floating IP, because uh, it's just on a private network at the moment. Okay, so we now have a, a floating IP associated with it. So that's 1020.100.1. Ah, I remember I didn't add any security rules to actually access that. So let's just go and do that now just to show you that all the features you get on a normal hypervisor you do get in containers as well. So we'll add some SSH connectivity. Ah, I've already used this IP before. One second. Okay, so this is the, uh, the KVM instance that we've got running on the cloud. So uh, I've demonstrated we were able to deploy it in containers. We can spin up um, uh, instances. We can network them effectively. We can do overlays. We can do north-south traffic routing. We can apply security group rules. All the things you'd expect to be able to do on hardware, I've been able to model accurately um, in containers on my laptop. We can also create block devices in Cinder. We can prevent, present those to the instances and simulate storage in exactly the same way.
Okay, so if you're deploying an OpenStack Cloud, you'll probably have testing and production environments that are server-based, because you want to be able to validate changes you're making into the environment, changes you're making into deployment tools, OpenStack upgrades, um, you know, the number of things that you need to be able to ver verify. So where does this type of concept fit in nicely? Well, it starts to allow you to make the laptop your first touch point on a change into your environment. So you can take that same bundle, you can redux it from your laptop, you can try a different configuration option, you can try a different topology, you can add some new components, you can verify that on your laptop. It takes about 15 minutes to stack a cloud this way. Um, so the, the teardown cycle is pretty fast. If you need to change that, iterate that. And then you can then take that and take that forward into testing on servers where your, turn around, your deployment time is probably going to be longer because servers take a long time to boot. You know, for a container, there's no, no post, nothing, no kernel to even boot. So the container bring up time is very, very fast. So it allows you to bring your laptop in on the front of uh, um, the changes you're making into your environment. So for people who are first touching on OpenStack, means they don't have to find five servers to try this stuff on to start off with. They can try this on, the, on their laptop today, uh, just using the, the tools that Ubuntu 16.04 is, is, is shipping with. So I demonstrated KVM Cloud. We also, we also in 16.04, have uh, a driver for managing instances on your cloud using the LexD hypervisor as well, Nova LexD. Uh, that's not in tree in Nova yet. That's a project we've been running under the, the LexC project um, as part of the, the, the activity around LexD. Um, but it, it does allow you to, to use a container um, in your cloud as well. So alongside KVM, you can have LexD containers with uh, consistent networking and, and on all the things you need to be able to mix those two things together. You can also run LexD in LexD. So we can then nest that and put that all together and try it on your laptop as well. So it, in the Git repo we've got, we've got a bundle that does LexD rather than KVM. So if you want to try that out, you can try that out as well. Um, another project we've um, been working on is a tool called Conjure Up. Um, it used to be called the OpenStack installer, which was really boring and very specific. Um, it actually kind of turned out to be a bit more generic um, as a, a tool for, for taking uh, deployment bundles using Juju to then deploy those both in containers in a single machine or using Maz onto to multiple machines. Um, so in 16.04, there's a tool called Conjure Up, and you can Conjure Up OpenStack, and that will allow you to try this. It will also allow you, if you have um, Maz set up and some spare servers, to deploy an OpenStack cloud a, a little bit more easily onto, onto that as well. Uh, I think you can also Conjure Up big data if you like that sort of thing. Um, so it's designed as a, a generic framework for uh, taking bundles and then driving placement of those across either containers for, for testing or for onto physical server infrastructure as you take that into more rigorous testing and into production. Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes left. So if anybody's got any questions, please uh, use the microphones and then they get on the recording as well. Hi, uh, we talked about the pros. I wanna know what's the cons of uh, running uh, OpenStack components in LXD, is there any? Sorry, can you? Is, is, is there any con for that? Like, what's the disadvantages? Well, you probably wouldn't run um, necessarily this in everything under containers in your production environment. So compute nodes are typically going to go onto hardware um, rather than into containers on hardware. So th this is a great way of not trashing your laptop by installing OpenStack on it. And as a result, it gives you a nice encapsulation of the thing you're trying to test. Um, rather than you having to do that all on the thing you're actually sitting on. And you can throw this away, and you've got no more state left of what you just tested. So that's the pro. Um, cons? I don't know. For the context, I think it's pretty cool. So. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have two questions. One, you showed you know, kind of putting your laptop in front of your dev process and making that the first stop for changes. Can you, I assume you deployed everything from Ubuntu packages. Is that it is possible to you know, incorporate this into a developer workflow where you're testing patches from source? And yeah, from so source? This, this is deployed from packages. Um, so it's, it's the result of development rather than part of development. Um, the charms for open, deploying OpenStack on Juju do deploy, de support deployment from source as well. So we have the ability to take OpenStack projects and instead of using our binary packages, um, pull those in and uh, deploy from Git repositories with appropriate requirements and pip install dependencies and stuff like that. So uh, 
we're kind of thinking along those lines that, yeah, there's some features that I'd really like to see land in LexD before we can make that reality. Um, I'd really love to be able to bind mount the Git repos I'm working on locally directly into my containers for my branches and install from that, and then have a nice iteration cycle where I make a change, rebase, whatever it might be, reload my deployed containers, and retest everything. So the answer is yeah, and that's kind of and where we'd like to go, but we're not quite there yet. So. And then second question, you mentioned like the profiles, and yeah. so you have a special profile for Nova Compute so it can talk to the kernel. Is that described in the charm metadata somehow, or is that some manual thing that you do after you've deployed the so containers? Um, for, for this demo, I pre-created the profile that Juju was going to use, because I know what its name's going to be, because it's D Juju default. It's, uh, it's the standard model that Juju 2.0 creates. Um, we're talking with the Juju team at the moment as to how you might express a profile as part of the charm to allow you to do that in a more automated way. And then that can then be applied on a service-by-service -service level rather than at the entire model level, which is where we are today. So, so going back to the LuxD within LuxD, um, uh, there's been talk with the, about the Nova LuxD uh, driver, essentially. Um, has that been implemented with all the Juju and uh, kind of an integrated environment where you yeah, can Yeah, yeah, so um, with the Nova Compute Charm, which is the principal charm for managing the hypervisor, um, supports LexD as, as of this release of the charms, which came out last Thursday. Um, we have another charm we, which is called LexD, which does all the underlying management of um, storage configuration um, and the actual underlying LexD daemon as part of that tool. So it's basically you add two charms to the bundle and you can do both in one. So. So kind of leading into this is where I'm really actually interested is uh, um, um, using LuxD as a test bed. I uh, would like to be able to test uh, uh, basically you know, op a multi-node op open stack environment that is mixed mode KVM and LuxD hypervisors uh, and how- It's entirely possible, yeah. yeah. So. So, so is that basically us using hypervisor types and, and delegating some computes as uh, KVM and other That's exactly right. Them? So by, by tagging up the images um, with appropriate hypervisor type metadata, the image properties filter will then schedule those onto the right underlying hypervisor. So determining the hypervisor is based on the image type yeah. and not by some other. Yeah. I mean, we're fortunate yeah. that Lexi and KVM use quite different image types, so it's very clear boundary there. I think it's also possible to do using f different flavors with additional extra specs as well. So yeah. there's kind of two routes there. Okay. But the combination of just picking an image and picking a flavor means that the flavors are consistent across any underlying hypervisor, which makes that a quite a neat story. Okay. I actually talked about this yesterday, so check that one out as well. Yeah, well. <laughs> Okay, looks like there's no more questions. If anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, I'll be around for the next 10 minutes or so, and thank you for listening.